trying to catch up today. So giving you a, a, a short message. And what we were going to talk about, we're going to talk today, is the way to my heavenly home. And uh, we have the slide here the way to my heavenly home. And the first text that we are going to look at, it's a very comforting text. One of the most comforting texts of the New Testament is John chapter 14, 1 to 5. Do not be worried and upset, Jesus told them. Believe in God, believe also in me. There are many rooms in my Father's house, and I am going to prepare a place for you. I would not tell you this if it were not so. And after I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to myself so that you will be, so, so that you will be where I am. You know the way that leads to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way to get there? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except by me. And uh, we know that this chapter is the continuation of the previous chapter in which Jesus says, my children, I shall not be with you much longer, which brought their hearts to be troubled. And that's why Jesus says, do not be troubled by that. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. What Jesus is answering troubled hearts by saying, believe in me. And he's doing the same thing with us today. Because what Jesus is in fact saying is that you, in the same way, you Jewish people, you believe in God that you do not see. Believe also in me in the same way. What Jesus is doing here is putting himself equal with God. Believe in God in the same way that you believe in the God of Israel. Believe in me in the same, the same, in the same way. And if we really understand this statement and we really practice it, we will not be afraid. We will not lose our mind. We will be able to sleep at night even if we have trouble, you know, uh, overwhelming troubles in our life and crisis. There's a difference be between, you know, like whether you are Christian or not Christian, all of us, we are going through similar human beings' problems. We are not uh, immune to the tragedies and the problem because you are Christian, nothing will ever hit your home. We go through similar problems because we belong to this earth. We belong to this world. And we belong to the, 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 the consequence of sin that infested this world. So we will go through the same tragedy, the same problem as a non-Christian. The difference is that you go with God or you go without God. And I'm thinking of some a, a, a tragedy that is happening and to someone that I know where the, one of the spouse is, has kind of left the Lord a few years ago and the, the mind is just want to compensate for a lack of God. What do you do when you go through a crisis and you don't have God? You want to control the situation. Until the situation is under your control, you cannot sleep at night. You need to control the problem right now. And then you, 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 you cause your, your spouse pressures and then you bring tension in the relationship. And the spouse is a Christian. The spouse goes to sleep at night. He can sleep and he can relax. Even though there's a crisis, it's a reality. The children are rebellious. There's a problem in the house. But, you know, sometimes when you are a Christian, you realize you're out of your resources. You cannot fix that. But you have a God. So you can pray. You can depend upon him, and you can wait upon him, so you can go to sleep. But the non-Christian with the same tragedy cannot sleep, because he, 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 it has to be solved right now. And that's a big problem, and Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. Then the same way you believe that God exists, believe in me. And if you believe in Jesus, your heart will be, will be at peace. And Jesus is really, really wonderful when he claimed that thing here. And the, the, one of the good places here that is so comforting, I'm going to prepare a place for you in my father's house. That is a good news to you and for me. Jesus is going away to prepare a place. Imagine the scene. Jesus could have disappeared. Yes? Because Jesus entered the house. He left the house. He appeared. He disappeared. He could have done it. But Jesus didn't leave this world like that. When he left this world, he gave his witnesses the view 
of where he's going, to give the impression, the deep impression that he is going somewhere. They were there. They lifted their eyes, and Jesus was taken up in front of their eyes. Imagine without this. Okay, Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place. But if Jesus disappeared, it's like it's, it would be hard to connect with the, the truth that he is somewhere else. He just disappeared. Where he is, I don't know where. But they saw him going to another place, like uh, the, the symbol of going to heaven. He went before their eyes. And then the angels testified, in the same way that you have seen him going to heaven, he's coming back in the same way. So, so it's good for you because he went there and some places. So when Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you, this is another location. It's telling you, I am going another place. And you have to come there because the next part is, tell is telling us. There are rooms there for all of us. Plenty, plenty of rooms. And knowing the generosity and the majesty of God, these rooms are going to be wonderful. Uh, the, some of the Bible versions says there are mansions and, uh, and heavens for you in the Father's house. And yes, there are mansions because God is so big. God is so great. So he's going to prepare a room. If you have a guest coming to your home, uh, let's say he says... Uh, uh, Keith's cousin is coming to his home uh, in six months' time. So Keith is not going to fix the, the friend's room tonight because he's coming only in six months. But maybe when the night before the, la the, the, the plane will land in Hong Kong, they will prepare the guest room. So Jesus says, I'm preparing a room for you. So that brings to us the assurance that Jesus is convinced that you are going to go there. That's a big encouragement because Jesus is preparing a room not for someone who is not coming. He's preparing the room for someone who is going there. So that's for you and that's for me. I don't understand how this is possible, but Paul explained it in this way. He who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. He has started something in your heart. It's going to make it right, and you're going to be complete, and you're going to be with Him. Amen? Hallelujah. That's so glorious. But the best part that I love the most is I will come back and take you to myself so that you will be where I am. And the take you to myself means receive near. It brings an idea of familiarity, intimate act of relation. So when Jesus says, I'm taking you, it's not just like a, just a hand like that. It's, it's an embrace. It's, it's an act of intimate love. He loves you so much that he wants you to be with him. It's a very act of very intimate. And it tells us that the, the joy about heaven, the focus of heaven, is that Jesus will be, there, will be there. The focus of heaven is not the new Jerusalem, it's not the new earth, it's not the city of gold, it's not these, all of these glories, these are benefits, added benefits. The, 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 the point of heaven, the excitement of heaven, the center of heaven is Jesus will be there. And he wants you to be close, closely associate with him, to be with him. He loves you that much. Amen? amen? Hallelujah. Don't miss a chance to say amen once in a while. Hallelujah. <laughs> and then he says, you know the place where I am going. So he's going to a place with the Father, as he told us, but it seems that for us it's difficult to know the place until we have seen the resurrection and the ascension, because when they saw the ascension, it's easier to, to know that. Jesus says, I am the way. Somewhere else Jesus says, I am the gate. The one who will enter through me will be saved. So there's the entrance point. And uh, it brings me to my next, uh, my next point where I'm going. Let's turn to the next, uh, the next slide. Jesus is answering questions about the way to go where he is going. Each individual must first find the way to enter and begin the journey. How long how difficult is the journey? We don't know. But Jesus answers many questions with this wonderful text by giving us an illustration. And these illustrations, there's only two, and that's very dramatic uh, fact here. There's only two destinations. 
Think about it. There's only two destinations for all mankind. It's very dramatic. Either you go there or you go here. You don't go to both places. It's not really an option where you can switch and whatever you do. It's, there is a two, the, the destinations of all mankind are here. And that's, that's very dramatic things. Because here it tells us many truths about it. How is it going to be? Now we will come back to this text here. Let's go to the next slide. It talks about a narrow gate and a broad gate. Jesus says, I am the gate, the one who enters by me shall be saved. So what do we learn about each gate based on the previous text? It is the gate that leads to heaven, the narrow gate, the small gate. Wait, wait. <laughs> it's difficult to enter and there will not be many people. That's also a tragedy. <laughs> Because that's the way to heaven. And there will not be many people who find it. That's very sad. And that's also a call to us as a church of Jesus. If we are the voice, if we are the one to bring the message, if we already know the message, and we realize Jesus is very clear and giving us this illustration. And then on the other side, there is a broad gate. It is a gate that leads to destructions, physical, spiritual, eternal destructions it's a destruction also of this of this life not only of the life to come and that we will talk a bit later it's very easy to go in it's accessible it's easy to find and most people are going through this white gate and this white gate is going to destructions that's very sad because it tells us that the majority of the people that you meet on the street, everywhere, in every country, and our families, everywhere, they are going there. Isn't it sad? It, but this, Jesus is as a, as a way to wake us up, isn't it? It's a simple text. We read it all the time. We know it. We can quote it. But then suddenly, when you think about it, it says, whoa, wait a minute. It's, it's, it's eternal. We're talking about eternity here. So, okay, let me ask you a question. You're all very intelligent, and many of you have already seen the answer to my questions. If we would put a sign over this gate here, what would it say? To heaven. Yes, you win the prize. You win the prize. Okay, come and see me after the service. I'll give you your prize. To heaven. Okay. Now, let's see if you are really, really intelligent. <laughs> what should be the sign over here? Hell. To hell. Is it? Destruction? Yes, you are right. But let me contradict you because I need to contradict you. It's very special. The sign over this one is not destructions. The destination is destructions. But the sign over it is not destructions. What is it? To heaven. to heaven. That's the deception. Both signs are showing they are going to heaven. Think about it, the, the logic of this. If there is a sign going to destructions, are you going to go there? No. You, you want to go to destructions? No. no, of course not. But if it says heaven, would you go? Yes. Okay, now if you have a small road, nobody is there, there's only like some bushes and everything, you're not sure where it leads, and there's a nice way here, everybody are there, your friends are there, like there's crowds there, people seem happy there, which one will you go? Hello? <laughs> of course you go to this way, there's a lot of people, it's easy, it's, it's, it's spacious, it's, it's fun, there's laughter there, it's easy going. There's no requirement. There's just, just go and you, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I'm going to the right place. I'm going to the right destinations. You know why I'm saying this? Go, click the next, uh, Tamara, please. The, this is verse 13, 14, and 15. Verse 15 says, Beware of false prophets who come disguised as armless sheep but are really vicious wolves. So in the same context where it says the narrow gate, the wide gate, the same context 
he says beware of the false prophets because there are definitely false prophets at the gate pointing this is the gate this is the right place the false prophets of this world making it easy for people to enter but the end is destructions the white gate is a gate of deception it tells you a message but it leads you to another place is that right do you see the point i'm not making it up i'm not making it up it's pretty obvious this is the gate of deceptions the white gate easy access easy to enter easy to find what jesus says many people will go in through the white gate let's go to the next slide where we're going backward our text will we'll stay there for a while look at this text let's talk about the gates the white gate is easy living you can bring your baggage your whole life your, your it's everything is found there's no re requirement it's pleasant it's easy it goes with the majority most people believe it it's okay there is room for diverse theology there is room for tolerance um, any religion will will do because you know in a way all the religion of this world have something in common most religion if you look at the human side of religion uh, do something good you know don't cheat be respectful of the old person do good to the poor you know like uh, live right and do good that's basically all the religion so this is the white gate is relativism everything is relative you believe something i believe something else but it's okay you believe my belief is fine so the white gate is uh, the gate of relativism you choose the easy way you have plenty of company but in this gate it's not only eternal perdition or destruction that you have but when you choose this gate you deprive yourself from the life that god created you for you separate yourself from the best the potentials the goals the activities of god the blessing of god the promises of god you 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 go with humanism but you go away from the lord you miss god's best for you so it's not only the end of of your life as a destruction but it's also failing to live out the purpose of your life right here right now you know when the apostles are asking jesus what will happen to us we gave everything to follow you he says you will receive all this 100 times more with trouble and this life and you will also receive the life to come so you receive and this life when you choose the narrow road you choose the best life you know to think about that it, the wide road looks fun but as i said it's a deception it's not fun when you are without god on that road it's not this is a lie of the enemy so that's why we need to be very clear about that what the sign says it says heaven but it is not true it's a life of deceptions oh there are so many people how can it be wrong that's the door of the majority when another truth about that when the text in the king james says many who enter in the white gate many enter in in, the, in the, the, the dictionary, you will find that it says, they enter into a mindset, a condition of life. They come into that life. It means thoughts that come into the mind. Once you enter the white gate and you go on the white road, you enter into that lifestyle. You accept the mindset, you accept the view, and you adopt it. So that will influence, will you influence you. Then we talk about the narrow gate. The narrow gate, why is there only a few who find the narrow gate? Why only a few choose the small gate and the narrow path that leads to everlasting life? There's a few uh, reasons. First of all, narrow here or small doesn't mean that it is hard to be saved. 
First of all, Jesus saves us. So it's not hard to be saved. Salvation has been gained through the blood of Jesus Christ. What it means here is that instead of relativism, like the white gate, it is exclusivism. It's exclusive. There is only one way. I am the way. I am the gate. Uh, no other name have been given under heaven by which you can be saved, man can be saved. The apostle Peter believed the message of Jesus. There is only one. So, so the main, the first truth about that, the narrow means there is only one. It's exclusive. And this will make a lot of antagonistic uh, people against you. A lot of people will hate you for that because they feel condemned and they feel judged when you quote a text like that. And there are many people who say, I believe Jesus is a great teacher, but I don't believe that Jesus said these kind of things about himself because they don't know the word of God. But Peter preached in Acts chapter 4 that Jesus is the only name under heaven by when you can be saved. So we believe that, that Jesus has, has said that. Another uh, interpretation of this is we go also, okay, the narrow gate, there's two terms here. Narrow and here you have difficult, narrow and difficult. A small is the gate. Maybe it's better this interpretation here because there are two different words. The word for the narrows or small here and here, it's not the same. The gate, the narrow gate, is, uh, means obstacles. There are obstacles there standing close about. There's obstacles. So why are there many people who do not find the gate? Because there are many obstacles that blocks the view of that small gate. It's, it's crowded, so it's hard to find. It's not wide and easy. The wide means it's flat, it's spacious, it's, it's easy to, to find. But the narrow one means there are obstacles. What kind of obstacles are we talking about? Well, you have people obstacles, uh, objections of people, arguments of people, what the majority thinks. You have also traditions and cultures. Each one of us comes from different cultures in this room here. We have uh, Pakistan, we have Africa, we have uh, America, we have Chinese, you know, we have Philippines. And we, all of us, we come from different traditions and different understanding and different viewpoints. And we come. Uh, and the religious traditions of China is different from religious traditions from the Philippines, very different in a way. Uh, that, that, that we, we do things. So we have these traditions. We, this is how we've been raised. This is how my grandparents were. We have all the mindsets that we, ha we have, the human views. Then you have the personal ambitions. My goals in life, uh, ambitions, I want to success, I want money, I want something else. Uh, then I'm not interested right now about the, the, uh, the small gate and eternity. I, I, I'm not interested even to think about that. I just want a good life right now. So that's an obstacle. So even though the gate is there and someone talks to me about the gates, my mind is not set to find it, so I'm not finding it. I am obstacle crowding the view of the small gate. There's something else into, into my mind crowding me. I have my personal desires, my lust, my greed, and everything. And then the vices. Some people, they are addicted to some sins and habits or something, and they, they are not willing to quit. They, you know, people love their sins that they are in. They don't want to uh, repent and, and just go for that. It takes the superpower of God to, to break that chain of someone. So you have many types of obstacle crowding, making an obstacle to this. That's why Jesus says, narrow is the gate, small is the gate. Not many find it because the, the word itself means obstacle standing about. So that, that is why the, the gate is very, very hard to find. An example of that is that Jesus is talking these words to the Jewish people. What are G the Jewish people believing in? They believe, will they easily believe that Jesus is the gate? Okay, Jesus, you're telling us you are the gate. Okay, we believe in you. No, up to today, they, they still reject him. So because they are disciples of Moses. They are raised in the culture. They, they have their religious views. They have been trained from childhood to believe in a certain way. So even if someone is telling them, Jesus is the gate, believe in Jesus and you will be saved. They cannot, they cannot see the gate. They have obstacles blocking them and the way. Amen? 
So Luke chapter 13, verse 23, Jesus will answer a little bit differently to that question. Lord, are only a few going to be saved? Because the person asking that question is troubling because he sees that at this point in the ministry of Jesus, not many people is turning to Jesus. So why is there only a few people that are going to be saved? And Jesus give an answer. Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. So there's some kind of a little secret here. To find the narrow door, there will be something that the individual will, will need to be in that mindset. Because if there are many things crowding and keeping us from finding the door, here Jesus says, somebody will need to strive. You will need a greater individualistic act of the will more. Like I was asking in the first service, how many of you know the Pilgrim's Progress? If you don't, please get the book, get the, the whatever, read this book. This is the second most read and translated book after the Bible. Pilgrim's Progress. This is a metaphor about just the journey to heaven. This is the most wonderful revealing of eternal truths that you can find uh, after the Bible. So please do that. In Pilgrim's Progress, this, the guy is named Christian. He finds a book, and in this book, it tells him about God's judgment. So where he lives is called City of Destruction. So then he is troubled and he has a big burden on his shoulder. W would you show us the Pilgrim's Progress slide? Just a moment, just to illustrate you. So that's, these are some illustrations of the Pilgrim's Progress. He is reading in the book, and this is the burden of his sin, the shame, and the burden that he is carrying. And he wants to get rid of that. He doesn't know how. He's afraid the city will be destroyed. So, so he doesn't know what to do. He talks to his family. They don't believe him. They mock him. So then he meets another one called Evangelist. And Evangelist is the one telling him where to go. He says, do you see the small gate over there? He says, mm, I'm not sure if I see. He says, do you see a light? Yes. Okay, follow that. So he leaves town. Then he is met with a lot of people come and they all symbolize something. He meets with obstinate and pliable. Of course, we know obstinate is mocking and rejecting and, you know. But pliable thinks it makes sense. Going to heaven. Wow, the glory is to come. And oh, 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 I will go with you. So happily, he just discovered and he goes with them. But not far along the way, they fall into the pond of despair, the slow of despond. So they both fall into this, which is like a, a symbolism of shame, of guilt, and uh, of all the darkness of the mind uh, without God. And uh, pilgrims or Christian is as a heavy burden on him so he, is, he cannot get out so pliable uh, swim or goes into the direction of the city of destruction where he's coming from says if this is the price we have to pay you know you you telling me about all the good things about heaven and i want to go there but if it is these kind of things and the trouble that we have i want to go back to my town so he goes back to town and he abandoned. So that is a, 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 a way to, to see. And Christian, because of the weight of his sin, cannot get out. So he needs external help. And God provides help and he comes, comes out. So then after that, he meets somebody else, which is uh, worldly wisdom. This is probably our worst enemy. Worldly wisdom as Christians is probably the worst because we don't realize the remarkable influence that worldly wisdom has even on Christian nowadays because worldly wisdom is all around us. Worldly wisdom is our colleague at work. Worldly wisdom is uh, religious thinking, the, the tolerance in this world and all this. So worldly wisdom, what it does, it's like it shows you an easier way to get rid of your guilt and of your sin. A better way to just feel good about yourself, you know. It's like the white gate. It's, it's exactly the message of the white gate. And he's pointing him to a city where the, the, the person of the city is uh, legality. And his son's name is civility. So it's about the, the law will set you free from your bondage. And, just, and then finally, uh, uh, 
Christian is distracted and he leaves the narrow path and he goes to follow the advice of worldly wisdom. And then he climbs a hill, very steep hill, and he cannot get it because, of course, he cannot get saved by the by the by the law. So he's, he's desperate, he's shameful, and everything. And again, evangelists come back and rebuke him and puts him back on the way. And then finally, he gets to the little gate uh, that will get him. When he will get to the little gate, he will meet someone called interpreter, and through many different symbolism, he will learn a lot of truths about, you know, the, the struggle of the Christian life and the, uh, you know, what's important, eternal truths and everything. So that is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful story that every Christian, I think, should should uh, read that. I'm, I'm listening to that with you the, the, this week. I listened to two versions, one dramatic and one uh, not, and uh, at the same time. So anyway. Uh, let's go back to the, the previous things. So these are some illustrations about that. Satan and his demons will fight you. People like Pliable will go back. Worldly wisdom will turn you uh, away to uh, a sense of, of, uh, of easy, easy road. There are two gates. One wide, one narrow. Two roads. Broad and narrow. This is the entry point. This is the beginning. You see, when you get saved, sometimes we have the impression that it's the, we have arrived. I'm saved, I have arrived. Not arrived, it's the beginning of the journey. It's just the beginning. When you get saved, you just start the journey to get to where Jesus is and the Father's home. You're not there yet. You need to go there. And there are many, many, many trials and adversities. Now I want to talk about the narrow way. We talk about the narrow gate. Now let's talk a little bit about the, the narrow way. The narrow way, the, the, the definitions of the narrow, the word narrow here, in this text you see narrow and difficult, which is it's true. This is a, a good, good uh, definition, difficult. It's also constrained, like it's... Uh, pressures, but the definition is to press as grapes, to press hard upon. Uh, it's like trouble, affliction, distress are pressing on. So the narrow road Jesus is telling us here that to follow him it will require certain things that are essentials. Faith, discipline, endurance, that the gate to Christian discipleship is narrow, it's not going to be easy. Things will come. But the good thing is that it's the only life worth living. The other one is a deception. First of all, it leads to the wrong destinations and it keeps you away from the blessing of God. Then this one, there's going to be a cost to pay. There's a commitment that is required. Repentance is a must. Holiness, you know, all of this, like the discipleship of life, the, the growing, the development, the maturity, it's all in this road. With the trials and adversities, like what we, the, the, one of the reasons I wanted to show the, the pictures of, of our missionaries today, they are a great example of that. And the people that uh, Brother Asif is also uh, is serving in many countries where they have the persecuted church. This is an example of that. The way to eternal life for many is going to have times of testing, testing our faith. It will require like strong perseverance. You know, when Jesus is calling people to, to come or people say, Jesus, I want to follow you, you will see in the New Testament and the Gospel that man, most of the time Jesus is saying, whoa, whoa, whoa wait, 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 think, think first. You see, if you want to follow me, you come behind me. The foxes have holes. The Son of Man doesn't have a place to lay his head. There's a price to pay. Oh, but let me first bury my father. Or let me first do this. Let me first do that. No, Jesus is not like that. Just as you will carry a cross. You will deny yourself. You will come. If you don't hate your, your own uh, family, you cannot be my disciple. If you don't deny your own life. So there's, there's you know, every time the people come to Jesus, Jesus says, wait. Wait before you enthusiastically come into the gate like pliable think you know because when pliable 
joined with um, his, his friend Christian. Christian did not told him anything because he didn't know, first of all, about the difficulties of the walk. He only says, oh, there's the glory. You will see the seraphim and the cherubims and the city of goals and all of that. That's all he said. Oh, that parable was very excited, very happy. You know the parable of the ones that uh, received the seed and shallow ground? That's exactly an example of that. When testing comes, they fall apart. They cannot go on because they have not been prepared. They have not been prepared that their time will not be easy. There is a cost. But the good thing is the only life worth living for two reasons, for its eternal destination and reward, but also for the excitement. It is the, the entry point, the beginning, that will lead us to a joy, to the life and abundance, to the, me, I would never change my life. Sometimes I go to Canada and people say, Oh, Pastor René, Sister Bridget, you have sacrificed so much. Me, sacrifice someone. I wouldn't change my life for you because they think I have left my family, we sold our home, we, we have no property in Canada, and we went to another land. And Okay, yes, we, 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 it's been tough in certain times, especially at the beginning, we were very poor. We were very, very poor. It was, it was hard. One time one of my daughters told me, why are we so poor? <laughs> and she, another time she told me, why don't you get a real job? <laughs> yeah, so anyway, so to tell you that it was not e easy at the beginning. Each end of the month was difficult, but I would never change my life for anything because the power of God, the promises of God, the, the adventure of the faith, the things that I have experienced, the things that I have seen from God, I would never trade that for all the gold and all the silver of this world. Never, 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 never. And these missionaries would not. They are not dressed in fancy clothing when they go and fixing these houses. Their life is hard. But can you imagine when they come back at night and they go to sleep, the joy of the Lord, the content man that they have been used by God that God is building his kingdom that people are being saved let me just read to you a, a few a short testimony of, of that uh, written by um, Pastor Renalin uh, she, she wrote that to me the last week so I just finished my Bible studies from three different areas and I was inspired for what I heard from the people the testimony of how God worked when we were there that week one sister used to tell me she wants to separate her husband because her husband is a gambler, drunkard, and sometimes uh, beated her. Every time she came to tell me she wants to separate her husband, I would say, okay then, if this is what you want. But remember that he was young, that he is young, and he can still remarry. Think about what will happen to you and your kids, and how you will live as a Christian. And most of the time I would tell her, have you ever prayed for your husband? And then she would say, yes. Then she says, trust Jesus to answer your prayer. And she would say, but I am tired of waiting. <laughs> and then I would only smile at her. But today, the Sunday of the anniversary, she was different. She was full of joy, grateful, full of hope. That Sunday when Pastor René was here, he surrendered his life to the Lord completely. He was baptized and completely transformed. No more gambling, no more drinking, and the love of their home is restored. Her husband was baptized last October 30. Praise the Lord who hear prayers. That is why, brothers and sisters, and the Lord be encouraged, because our labor is not in vain. That is the narrow road. That is the best road. The only road means uh, that is worth living. This is where all the excitement, this is where the reality of the kingdom of God come into your life. This is where you learn. To, you touch something, it becomes holy. The Lord multiplies the bread. The Lord raised the dead. I told you, the, did I tell you the, the, the testimony of uh, the resurrection last week? Yeah, the, this, this, is, this is awesome. I don't know if you were not here. You missed that last week. But uh, Sister Rinalin on October 20, after she returned, Turn home. Her life is hard. She lives in the countryside and rice field. It's, it's, it's not like uh, living in, in luxury. She heard screaming at night. The, one of the men that we baptized that did that also converted, uh, not, not this one we're reading now, but the other one, died 
He really died. He's a drunken man. He drank so much, he came home and he was aggressive and he was violent. He stopped breathing and he fell, he collapsed on the ground. Neighbors came, they tried to reanimate him. He did not breathe for a long time. And all the neighbors were there. They tried to massage him and bring him back. The wife was shouting, the children were shouting, oh God bring, and the, the, the teenage daughter says, God, don't let him go, bring him back. So Renalin, Pastor Renalin, heard screaming her name because that teenage daughter is, is screamed. The wife was a high pressure, was so much high pressure, she fainted and she almost died herself. When they took the machine to, to take her, uh, her high uh, blood pressure, the machine says, error. <laughs> So she, it, was, it was that bad, you could not even read. So she almost died, on, and that night, this teenage daughter almost died, uh, two, uh, two parents, uh, lost her two parents. So when Pastor Renalin heard the scream, Pastor, Pastor, so she came home, and then she found all the scene, people massaging him and all this. So she came, she laid her hands on him and says, Lord, please have mercy on this family, bring the, the bread thing back to this house. And then as she prayed, that prayer said, oh! And then he came back to life. What do you think happened to this guy? He stopped drinking <laughs> and he was baptized. We baptized him. So these are wonderful. You cannot experience that on the white road. You can never see the power of God in your life in the excitement. You see, and then another testimony says, My father, yes, finally had stopped drinking. My dad was alcoholic and when he did not drink, his body was shaking. My sisters who got saved and I really prayed for him. His health was failing because of alcohol and three times he got into motorcycle accident. He tried to stop drinking by himself and two days later he would go back. He could not resist the temptation. But because our God is a good God, the day when Pastor Rene called the altar call, he came forward. From that day until now, he had stopped drinking. My sister testified last Sunday that my dad had refused for the first time his friends who offered to drink for free. And last Sunday, he was invited again to an occasion where men usually get drunk after the event, but he refused to drink again. So I was overwhelmed with joy that my God, our God, He's a big, big God. Glory and honor belongs to Him. I hope you will be encouraged by what the Lord is doing here in the very end of the earth in Mindanao. This is the white gate or the narrow gate. It's a choice. One is a deception and the other one is the real life. It costs something. It's a life of a discipleship. It's a life of commitment, of sacrifice, of right choices, of work of service, of humility, is the, the road of imitation of Jesus Christ. It's the road of the cross. It's a place for repentance. It's a place for renewal. But it's a place for miracles. It's a place for the new life. It's a place for the fullness of God. It's the only life worth living. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Father God, thank you. Thank you for this eternal truth.